How's it going, everybody? Welcome to D4. This is the show where each week we take a deep dive into one, sometimes two, specific character builds for Dungeons and Dragons. We crunch numbers about them. We theorycraft about them. Not because I want to tell you the right way or the best way to play a character in D&D, but just to explore one potential way for creating and playing a character with the hopes of building something that's both really fun, but also powerful to play in-game. So if you enjoy creating characters for D&D almost as much as you enjoy playing the actual game itself, or if you're just looking for tips or ideas on a particular character that you're thinking about playing, then welcome home. This is where you belong. It really is, and I'm so glad you're here, so thank you for being here. My name's Colby, and I'll be your host. Right, I think we're gonna go long today, so let's just jump right in. Based on the number of requests that I have had over the years to do an aberrant mind sorcerer mixed with a fathomless warlock, a lot of you have a tentacle fetish. <laughs> now, I've actually been having people ask me to do an aberrant mind sorcerer ever since Tasha's Cauldron of Everything came out like almost two years ago. I've put it off forever for a couple of reasons. One, I tend to get really creeped out by Lovecraftian horror. I am probably what some people would call tentacle averse. But more than that, while there are a lot of really cool things mechanically about the subclass, there's just not a ton of features that, to me, on first glance anyway, say this is something that can be easily quantified in a spreadsheet. I mean, the ability to cast spells without verbal, somatic, or even material components most of the time when casting is no doubt amazing. But that's kind of difficult to know how useful that will actually be for most people in most combat encounters. Also, being able to cast spells with sorcery points instead of spell slots might mean that you could cast certain spells more often during the course of a day. Again, really cool, kind of hard to quantify. And then, of course, there's the Fathomless Warlock aspect. I think we put the subclass to some pretty great use when we did the Frost Mage uh, a while back, but again, there's just not a ton that jumps off the page at me that would make the subclass something to build around for really great, like, sustained damage or even Nova or Burst damage, etc. Yeah? I think, then, what you want to do when trying to create a really great tentacle master, keep it clean in the comments, please, is to do two things. One, stop thinking about the spreadsheet so much, dang it. <laughs> I mean, obviously that's something that we should probably apply to every D&D character build, right? It, just because something isn't easily quantifiable doesn't mean that it's not potent, powerful, useful, or most importantly, of course, fun. And as longtime viewers of my channel know, my favorite builds are ones where we're building primarily around a character concept or theme and not just trying to build like the most powerful X, right? So yes, this build that we're gonna work on today is definitely one that falls into that category for sure. We're going Aberrant Mind, Sorcerer, Fathomless Warlock, not because it's the most optimized character in the world, but because we love the concept. And so let's see how powerful we can make it while working within the framework of that concept. And so with that in mind, the other thing that I think we ought to be doing when looking at this character concept is to especially focus on the expanded spell list from Aberrant Mind and see if we can't figure out what it is that's unique about the spells that they specifically get access to when compared to other sorcerers. What kinds of things can an Aberrant Mind sorcerer do that other sorcerers couldn't do as easily anyway, without a lot of multi-classing, etc. What does this expanded spell list make them excel at in particular? The answer, I think, becomes fairly simple when looked at in that light, and to me, it's debuffing and control. Especially when coupled with the Fathomless Warlock, and especially considering the other perks that they get from psionic spells. And so, that is what we're going to be focusing on with the build today. A psionic, perhaps illithid-inspired tentacle master character who does two things really well. Supports their team in the form of controlling and debuffing their enemies, while also throwing down some fairly respectable burst or nova damage. Though, in our case, the damage is going to be multi-target or area of effect focused. And so, I proudly present episode 109, the... Octolock, the cultist of the deep ones. The tentacle master? Ew. How about episode 109, the mind flayer? 
Huge thanks to my friend Randall Hampton for creating this fantastic artwork. He nailed it this week like he does every single week. He's a fantastic artist, and if you would be interested in following him or reaching out to him to see if you might be able to commission him to create something for your character or even your party. Commissions are closed a lot of times because he gets really busy, but follow him, keep an eye on him, and you might be able to snag him when his commissions are open. I will, as always, put links in the video description on how to do that. Thanks, Randall. Also, before we jump into the build, let me read you guys the description for this character that the team over at Describe has come up with since they are, once again, the sponsor for the video this week. An oversized bald head with tentacles dangling like a beard tops this willowy figure. The being's skin is violet and hairless, their eyes and claws glossy black. Indigo robes drape their thin frame with lighter blues on the fabric evoking light seen from watery depths. Their facial appendages twitch and reach as the being incants in a sibilant voice. One clawed hand clutches an orb of azure that swirls with smoky tendrils, the other points. From the ground, misty strands erupt, thickening into a field of thrashing black tentacles. So good. And creepy, right? Ooh. For those who don't know, Describe is a fantastic tool that players and DMs alike can use to get professionally written descriptions of almost anything you can imagine wanting a description in D&D for. Settings, yes, but also characters, like I've just read, attacks, dialogue, spells, magic items, etc. And if it hasn't already been written, you can request that they create something for you if you've got the right subscription, at least a hero subscription. But even with a free account that's available to anyone, you can get access to thousands and thousands of of searchable descriptions in their massive library that's growing every single day. Of course, they also provide so much more than just box text-like descriptions, including poetry and songs that you might want to throw into your game to add some really great flavor, amazing and gorgeous maps, They've partnered with professional artists that you can commission to draw amazing artwork for your character and much, much more. This week, I simply wanted to tell you guys about a couple of things that are new going on with Describe. First, their scholarship. This is simply a way for Describe to give back to the community, um, especially the gaming and writing community, I think. They're starting an annual scholarship that gives $2,000 US dollars for education, business startup costs, or any other form of self-development, so it doesn't just have to be for school. The recipient of the scholarship each year will be given, in addition, a Masterclass Describe subscription that's worth $180, and will also get to meet the founders of Describe, as well as a veteran game designer and writer that works for them, and a lead editor that works for them as well, so kind of a cool little mentorship opportunity. Best part is, anyone can apply just head over to describe.com slash scholarship to find out how. In addition, I wanted to let you all know about Describe's September 2022 giveaway. There's still about a week and a half at the time of this release to enter and win, so check it out. You can enter in a number of ways, basically by following them on Discord, Facebook, Twitter, etc. And then they're gonna pick one lucky follower at the end of the month to get two player subscriptions, one hero subscription, and believe it or not, a Pathfinder 2E beginner box and core rule book. So if you've ever, like me actually, been Pathfinder curious, <laughs> there's no shame. Now might be a great time to jump in. Even if you're not interested in the giveaway and still wanna check them out, be sure to go to describe.com slash D4. If you'd use that link, I'd appreciate it because that's how they know that I sent you. I will put the link in the video description as well, of course. And if you decide to purchase a subscription of any type, be sure to use the code D4 at checkout to save 10%. Huge thanks to Describe, love you guys, and let's jump into the build. All right, at level one, little bit of a spoiler warning here, I am planning on taking a fighter dip later on in this character build, and for that reason, I almost started fighter here. You might want to do that. They get constitution saving throw proficiency, which we really want on this character, especially since we're going to be concentrating on a spell throughout our career, not to mention armor and shield proficiency, among other things. It'd be really great for defensive purposes. That said, I'm kind of sick of starting fighter. Plus, if I start off focused on the caster levels, then I can get my main combat rotation going by level six when we do our first damage report. So suck it fighters, not today. But if I were playing this character in game, I'd probably start with a level one fighter. <laughs> 
But no, we are starting Sorcerer. Fortunately for us, Sorcerers also get Constitution Saving Throw Proficiency. And as for our race, I'm gonna go with Custom Lineage, but for two reasons. Yes, first off, mechanically, we get a free feat at level one. That's insanely powerful. It's gonna let us start with an 18 Charisma, and I love that. But two, and this actually really is important to me for this build, it's really the only way currently, according to rules as written without homebrewing anything, that I could play a character that might look a little bit like an Illithid. And if I'm going to be playing a character that's like a tentacle master, then you better believe that I want some tentacles on their face. Now, of course, you don't have to go that route. Or maybe you'd want them to be like, how about like a half Illithid, half Githyanki? Forbidden love child? Now that's some serious Romeo and Juliet stuff going on in your D&D setting. As for the free feat that we get as a custom lineage character, I think I would probably go telekinetic here, especially since it offers us so many mechanical advantages as well. First off, it's a half feat, yes, meaning we can add one to, for us, our charisma score. What's more, with telekinetic, we learn the mage hand cantrip for free. That's nice. We can cast it without verbal or somatic components, also nice, as well as kind of a recurring theme for this character, and can even make it invisible. Best of all, with this feat, we can, as a bonus action, move a character five feet toward or away from us, if they're willing, otherwise they get to make a strength saving throw. Moving enemies is also going to be super valuable for this character and kind of a theme, so this is kind of just the perfect feat for us. I love it. As for our ability scores, I assume as always we're taking the point by method and I would recommend starting with a 15 charisma and taking a plus two from our racial bonus there as well as the plus one from telekinetic giving us an 18, a 14 constitution and a 14 dexterity. As for our equipment, I don't have any really strong recommendations. We don't have any armor proficiencies. We're not planning on using weapons. So just kind of take your basic necessities, maybe go gold buy and pocket some stuff since we're not gonna really need a lot of the usual starting equipment we get. But then as a sorcerer at level one, of course we get our subclass right off the bat, our sorceress origin, and yes, we're going Aberrant Mind. Since this is the first time that I've done an Aberrant Mind sorcerer in a build, hooray, let's read what Watsi has to say about them. An alien influence has wrapped its tendrils around your mind, giving you psionic power. You can now touch other minds with that power and alter the world around you by using it to control the magical energy of the multiverse. Will this power shine from you as a hopeful beacon to others? Or will you be a source of terror to those who feel the stab of your mind and witness the strange manifestations of your might? As an aberrant mind sorcerer, you decide how you acquired your powers. Were you born with them? Or did an event later in life leave you shining with psionic awareness? And then we get an aberrant mind table that we can roll on or just choose from to determine the source of our power. Now, Obviously, an aberrant mind sorcerer doesn't have to get their powers from some sort of illithid creature, right? Tentacles are not necessarily inherent in the subclass, but I think it's telling that so much of the flavor text around this subclass does sort of make you think of like a slimy tentacle face. I mean, right there I just read it talks about how it's wrapped its tendrils around your mind, and then there are options on this little roll chart to say that you got your powers from an aboleth, or you were in planted with a mind flayer tadpole and those kinds of things like continue throughout the character progression later telling us that our eyes might be covered with writhing sensory tendrils or that we grow writhing cilia that extend through our clothing etc etc i think for me i'm probably going with the mind flayer tadpole option myself for this character but i think i would work it into my backstory that like i somehow overcame that mind controlled state maybe post the transformation that it wrought in me somehow. So now I'm like a mind flayer with a heart of gold, as it were, perhaps bent on extracting vengeance upon the creatures who did this to me in the first place. Maybe I really am like part Githyanki or originally Githyanki and that hatred against the Illithid might still be with me, though I have become now at least in part like one of them. That's kind of interesting. Anyway, as an aberrant mind sorcerer, we get a couple of nice little features. First up, we get psionic spells. And this is a really fantastic feature, though it can be a bit daunting as well. So first up, 
we just get an expanded spell list of free thematically appropriate spells that we just automatically know. Awesome. Where it gets a little daunting is that whenever we gain a sorcerer level, we can replace one of those free spells with another spell of our choosing, so long as it's from the divination or enchantment schools of the sorcerer, warlock, or wizard spell lists. So in a way, really getting the most out of your aberrant mind sorcerer becomes a bit of an exercise in trying to determine the most powerful divination or enchantment spells from those spell lists, right? Now, Admittedly, spell analysis isn't necessarily one of my fortes, I don't think. I think Triant Monk's a lot better at that than I am, frankly. But it has been a lot of fun combing through all of the possibilities and searching for the spells that we might want to use to greatest effect for control, debuffing, and burst damage purposes. And it's made this character build, for me, a lot of fun and challenging in a way that maybe a lot of builds haven't been for me lately. It took me a lot longer to come up with all of this, but it was fun. I really enjoyed it. Anyway, we'll discuss what those spells are going to be as we get to each new spell level as we go, but also we do get an ability later on as an aberrant mind sorcerer that really enhances how we use these spells from this psionic spell list. So picking the right ones is really important. We also here get the telepathic speech feature, which tells us that as a bonus action, we can choose one creature within 30 feet of us, and then for a number of minutes equal to our sorcerer level, we can communicate with each other telepathically so long as we stay within a number of miles equal to our charisma modifier, miles and it doesn't get blocked by stone or lead or anything. That's a fantastic ribbon feature, really, and really great for utility purposes, no question. As for the spells that we get here at first level, let's dive in. First off, we get those free ones from the psionic spells feature that I mentioned. Those are Mind Sliver, which is a really fantastic cantrip. You cast it as an action, and then if the enemy fails their intelligence save, which is a really great saving throw to be targeting, most enemies in D&D don't have a great intelligence saving throw. This is something we're going to see repeated throughout this character build. But if they fail that save, then they take a little bit of damage from Mind Sliver, and then we'll have to lower their next saving throw by a 1d4. Super potent to help us set up a really important spell that either we or an ally are going to be casting, right? Like maybe a control spell, such as Dissonant Whispers, which is another free one that we get, typically only available to bards and Great Old One Warlocks, and I'm planning on doing a Great Old One Warlock build around this spell, actually, sometime in the future. With Dissonant Whispers, you cast it as an action, and then if the enemy fails their wisdom save, they take damage and have to run away from you. A nice little damage and control option that can even provoke opportunity attacks. Yes, it can. Look it up. I'm probably keeping that one, I think. The third one, though, Arms of Hadar, I don't love quite as much, despite the tentacle feel to it. It does 2d6 necrotic damage and then keeps enemies from taking a reaction on their turn for anyone that's within 10 feet of us. It's not terrible, but I would probably swap that one out, I think, for Silvery Barbs, which counts because it's an enchantment spell. You know, I feel like the hatred and vitriol have died down against Silvery Barbs lately compared to when it first came out. Am I wrong? I hope not, because I got really tired of constantly being attacked by the Silvery Barbs mob. Admittedly, yes, it is a very strong spell. You cast it as a reaction when an enemy has succeeded on an attack, saving throw, or ability check, and force them to reroll. You then get to give advantage to a party member that they use on their next attack, ability check, or save within the next minute. Couple this with Mind Sliver, and you can almost guarantee that the enemy is going to fail an incoming saving throw, right? As for other spells that I'd take at this level, I would grab Firebolt or Ray of Frost for like an offensive cantrip, and then the usual defensive suspects, I think. Mage Armor, since we resisted the temptation to start as a fighter. Shield, Absorb Elements. Maybe if you wanted another control option at level one, in addition to Dissonant Whispers, you could go with Tasha's Hideous Laughter. That can knock a target prone and incapacitate them. It's a really strong control and debuff option, which is right up our alley. So yeah, go for that if you feel like you can fit it in. At level two, we get Font of Magic. That's our sorcery points. And that's really important for all sorcerers, but especially important for aberrant mind sorcerers, as we'll get into later. So we get one sorcery point per level, and we get them back after a long rest. 
Sorcery points, of course, are used to fuel our metamagic options, which we get next level, but can also be used to create spell slots, and then vice versa, we can take our spell slots and turn them into sorcery points. Now, I usually kind of just gloss over this feature when I do sorcerer builds, but this flexible casting is going to be really integral to us as an aberrant mind. So let's just be clear here. As a bonus action, we can create spell slots from our sorcery points, or more importantly for us, create sorcery points from our spell slots. When we do that, we get one sorcery point per spell slot expended. So first level spell slots give one sorcery point, fifth level spell slots give five sorcery points, etc. Again, we'll be taking advantage of this later. At level three, we get metamagic. So I love metamagic, and I hate only getting to choose two options, which is all we get for now. Metamagic can be used to enhance our spells in a variety of ways. I think for me, for this build, I'm gonna go with my two favorites. Quicken Spell, which lets you cast a spell that normally takes an action as a bonus action instead. That costs us two sorcery points, it's not cheap. And then there's Twin Spell, speaking of not cheap, which lets you take a spell that normally targets only one creature and have it target a second creature also. The big drawback to Twin Spell is that it's super expensive, costing one sorcery point per spell level that you're twinning. It can be very potent when you're casting like a strong single target control spell though, so I think I'd want it in my arsenal. Heightened Spell would be another expensive but great option for this build. I think Careful Spell would be worth considering since we will be using some AoE spells here and it would be nice to kind of help our companions avoid being impacted by them or impacted as much. Another community favorite subtle spell actually becomes a bit redundant on this build, at least eventually, as we'll discuss later. We do also, of course, get second level spells here, and let's talk about those. First up, our psionic spells feature gives us calm emotions and detect thoughts for free. Both are decent spells, effective for utility purposes, but I think I'd probably swap one of them out at least for the very powerful Tasha's Mind Whip. And yes, I know this and Silvery Barbs are both readily available to sorcerers already, so before you argue why are we swapping this out for another sorcerer spell, it is, again, like I mentioned important to know which of our spells are considered part of our psionic spells feature because like I said they get buffed later. So with Tasha's Mind Whip you force again an intelligence saving throw on a target and if they fail they take 3d6 damage, not bad, can't take reactions until the end of their next turn and then best of all on their next turn they can either move, take an action, or a bonus action. Just one of those three. That's Kind of incredible. So yes, a fantastic debuff control option that also does damage. My favorite part of the spell is that if you upcast it, it doesn't do more damage, but instead, when you upcast it, it can target an additional creature for every spell level that you upcast it. That's really potent. For now, it's a good one to consider twinning until we can get higher level spell slots, I think. The other one that I wanted to be sure and mention here is the web spell. Web is not one that we'd get to call a psionic spell, but that's okay. It's a fantastic spell regardless. As we've discussed before, most recently I think in the hammer time, like battlesmith controller build that we did. With web, you cast it, it covers a 20 foot cube. That area becomes difficult to rain and then any creature who starts their turn in the area or moves into the area on their turn has to make a dexterity saving throw or they are restrained. Restrained is such a powerful controlling debuff to inflict on an enemy as it means that they can't move, they have disadvantage on dexterity saving throws and attacks, and then attacks made against them are made with advantage. Now, a restrained creature can later use their action to make a strength check against your spell DC to see if they break out of that restraint, but even if they succeed, they've wasted their action trying to break out. So it's still a really nice form of control that you're inflicting on them, helping keep your party safe. At level four, we would get our first ability score increase or feat, and I am going to say let's bump our charisma and cap it at 20, and capping our primary ability score right at level four just feels so good. It makes me the happiest D&D player ever. It's gonna be fantastic for our spell save DC and our damage, and I love it. But at level five, now that we have an important area control spell in web and a really strong single target or double I guess if twinned control spell in Tasha's mind whip and our charisma score capped as well as some sorcery points I think it might be time to take the plunge into fathomless warlock 
pun intended, it turns out that our character is so desperate to exact vengeance that they have made contact with a powerful being of the deeps. Or perhaps sensing a sort of kinship with you in your tentacled ways, an ancient kraken has reached out to make contact with you, sensing your desperation for the power you need to exact that vengeance. They've offered you additional power in exchange for your pact of service. Whatever your reasons, yes, we're taking Warlock levels now. And at Warlock 1, we also get our Warlock subclass, our otherworldly patron, and yes, we're going fathomless. The truth is, we do get some really important things for this build from Warlock, but the fathomless subclass itself doesn't really bring anything, at least that we're going to be taking advantage of during our Nova round, as I kind of mentioned in the preamble. That said, it does bring some really nice utility and even better, some sustained damage and control that we would enjoy outside of our Nova round. And that's fantastic. And of course, more importantly, it is by far the most tentacular of all Warlock subclasses. And so for this character, for thematic reasons, if for none other, yeah. We're going Fathomless Warlock. And as such, we get a couple of nice little features. We get Gift of the Sea. This tells us that we have a swim speed of 40 feet. Very nice. And can breathe underwater. Even better. As ribbon features go, this is pretty top notch, especially if you're playing in like a water or ship heavy campaign. But the stronger and more tentacly feature, of course, is Tentacle of the Deeps, which tells us that proficiency bonus times per day, as a bonus action, we can summon a 10 foot long tentacle and make a melee spell attack with it against an enemy within 10 feet of it. That does 1d8 damage, and if it hits, it reduces the enemy's move speed by 10 feet. We can then use our bonus action every turn thereafter for one minute to move it 30 feet and repeat that attack. Considering that web is considered difficult terrain, this could make getting out of web that much more difficult for our enemies even if they break their restraint, right? Now, no, like I said, I'm not going to plan on using this during our Nova round, but having it as an option for some additional control and damage outside of that Nova round is gonna make us that much better at doing damage and controlling the battlefield. And so, yeah, it's a welcome tool, even if it's not gonna necessarily show up in the damage reports. We do get Warlock spells here, of course, and I would probably be sure to pick up Hex. We're not going to be using it on our Nova round, but it might be nice to have for those fights that you don't care as much about control for whatever reason. Maybe you're going up against a single, especially flying boss enemy or something, and you just want to maximize damage against them instead. Probably get Armor of Agathis, since it's a nice defensive spell that gives us some temporary hit points and returns damage to melee attackers, and it's unique to Warlocks. It scales really well too. But the spell I'm most concerned about getting at this level is, yeah, that most potent of cantrips unique to Warlocks, Eldritch Blast. I don't think I've focused on using Eldritch Blast in a build for a long time. It's a really powerful cantrip, as now that we're level five, right, fires two beams of energy that can be directed at one target, or you can split them up and do one at one target, and one at another. You make a spell attack, and if you hit, you do 1d10 damage per beam. But of course, the thing that makes Eldritch Blast so good is the Eldritch Invocations that we get at Warlock 2, which is what we are now at level 6. We're Warlock 2. We get two Eldritch Invocations for now, and we want the two that are going to really buff Eldritch Blast for us. First up, Agonizing Blast. That just simply lets us add our Charisma modifier to the damage that each Eldritch Blast beam does, making it akin to like a really powerful ranged weapon attack. And that makes us even happier that we've capped our Charisma score now. And then, of course, we want Repelling Blast. This tells us that when we hit a creature with our Eldritch Blast, we can push them up to 10 feet away from us in a straight line. And that's amazing, especially since we have two beams now, meaning that we can potentially push two targets, right? Awesome. And don't forget that we also get a second Warlock spell slot at this level, and that's pretty important considering that, again, as a Warlock, we get those spell slots back on a short rest. And in fact, this is going to become even more valuable later for us since we can actually convert even Warlock spell slots into sorcery points. If you don't believe this, here's a tweet from Jeremy Crawford confirming. 
And yeah, since Warlock spell slots reset on a short rest, that means we have a yummy source of sorcery points that we can replenish more often than the usual on a long rest that non sorlocks are limited to. And for us, that's particularly great because we are going to be making really great use of those sorcery points very soon, so remember that. All right. At level six, it's time for our first damage report, so let's discuss what combat is going to look like for us right now, tactically. On round one, we wanna set up our control, casting web in a way to affect the greatest number of enemies possible. You might even want to use quicken spell on web, casting it as a bonus action, and then casting eldritch blast with your action to start the damage going right away. Remember, the rules are that if you cast a spell as a bonus action, any spell, then the only other spell you can cast that turn is a cantrip with a casting time of one action. So yeah, Eldritch Blast would qualify. Round two is when we go Nova. For now, that simply means using Quicken Spell to cast Eldritch Blast as a bonus action, then using our action to cast Eldritch Blast again. The thing that makes this so potent, of course, is that we can push an enemy up to 10 feet away from us if we hit them with Eldritch Blast. So. The idea, yes, is to do everything we can to just round up all the little enemies and corral them into our web spell with lots of Eldritch Blasts. So we could, for example, fire off two beams at two different enemies that were between us and our web, and then, you know, move over a little bit and try to hit a couple more that were like on the other side of web or something, right? Pushing them in as well hopefully. Potentially trapping up to four enemies in our web during our Nova round, if they were all standing in just the right spot, of course. And that's saying nothing of the enemies we might have caught in it in the initial casting. Of course, the reality is that there's a good chance that one or two of those enemies we first captured managed to break out of the restraint and get out, and then in that case our goal is to simply push them back in. Now, since I always assume best case scenario numbers when I crunch them, I'm gonna go ahead and assume that the enemies we're attacking here are already in the web restrained, meaning that we'll have advantage on our attacks. I appreciate that the more optimal play might be to push enemies back in that have escaped or that weren't in there in the first place. So if that's what you're doing and you're not gonna have advantage due to a fairy fire spell or something that an ally has cast, then yeah, we'll wanna lower these numbers slightly, especially against the higher enemy ACs. But for now, the assumption is we're firing four Eldritch Blasts with advantage on our Nova round and doing 4d10 plus 20 if all of them hit. And so against an enemy with a 10 armor class, we would do 44 damage on average. And against an enemy with a 15 armor class, it would be 40 damage during our burst round. Now, considering that I'm going to assume we're making these attacks against multiple targets for control purposes, and especially because later on I'm going to be intentionally doing some area of effect damage, I'm gonna place this character into the newly created tier four of my burst damage builds. Um, see the video here where I rank them anew. In tier four, all of those builds are focused on multi-target damage, and so as a result, this character at this level is very near the bottom of that tier. But you know what? They bring a lot of control inherent in what they're doing even during their Nova round, and so I don't feel bad about their damage that they're doing at all. I love the pushing into web that's going on here, and the tactic is going to get even better and more powerful soon. Not only that, but outside of your Nova round, you've still got your tentacle attack option, your telekinetic feat to move a target back into your web, as well as some really potent spells like Tasha's Mind Whip to throw around that are going to do really great things for both our damage and control. We're a really solid Mind Flayer right now, but we're about to get a whole lot more potent. So at level seven, with Eldritch Blast and those important invocations in place, I think we're best off going back to Sorcerer for a while to pick up some better spells, more sorcery points, and a very, very strong Aberrant Mind feature. So, we're gonna be a Sorcerer 5 here, and that means we get third level spells. The ones we get for free as part of our psionic spell list are Hunger of Hadar and Sending. Hunger of Hadar might be a replacement spell for web at this level. It's not quite as firm a control spell, but it's a much larger area, 20 foot diameter sphere, so twice the size really. And then that area is also difficult terrain, plus anyone inside it is effectively blinded. The best part, of course, is that it's filled with a cacophony of soft whispers and slurping noises that can be heard from 30 feet away. Just in time for Halloween, right? Now, unlike Web, creatures that end their turn or start their turn in the area take 2d6 cold or acid damage, respectively, as 
milky tendrils rub against them. Milky? What the heck is a milky tendril? Gross. As for sending, it's a nice way to telepathically send a message to someone across any distance, and even other planes of existence, potentially. Nice utility. I'm not sure I would swap out these spells for a different enchantment or divination spell, to be honest. Maybe incite greed? I don't know. It's not a bad control spell. Let me know if you think there's one that you would switch it for, because they do have to be of the same level, right? As for other third level spells that we get here, of course there are too many good ones to dive into, but all the usual suspects should be considered. Counterspell, Dispel Magic, Fear, Hypnotic Pattern, Fireball. In fact, I'd say definitely pick up Fireball. I'm gonna make use of that in our next damage report, so stay tuned for that. At level eight, we would be a Sorcerer Six, and this is where things get really good for Aberrant Mind Sorcerers. First up, we get Psychic Defense, which just straight up gives us resistance to psychic damage. Not bad. And then also, advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. That's a nice little package of defensive features right there. Even better, of course, is the Psionic Sorcery feature. And this is the reason why we wanted to be so careful about which of our spells were considered Psionic spells. Because now, when you cast one of those spells, specifically, you can choose to cast it with sorcery points instead of spell slots. We spend sorcery points equal to the spell's level. And remember, as a bonus action, we can exchange a spell slot for an equivalent number of sorcery points anytime. So there's no loss of sorcery points here for doing this. You know, any sorcerer can exchange sorcery points for spell slots, but they do it at a slightly more expensive price, right? It costs two sorcery points for a first level spell slot, whereas it would cost us one sorcery point to cast a first level spell, if it were a psionic spell. In a nutshell, then, this means that since we also have a pool of sorcery points that we get inherently with every level of sorcerer, and we can even cannibalize our warlock spell slots for more sorcery points and those reset on a short rest, we can potentially cast more spells per long rest than other sorcerers, if we're casting our psionic spells anyway. But the best part of this feature is that if we cast the psionic spell with sorcery points, we can do so without any verbal, somatic, or material components, unless it's a material component that's consumed by the casting of the spell. And that is really quite amazing. This means that those spells can really never be counterspelled, since in order to counterspell something, you have to see a creature casting a spell. And if there are no components to the spell, and instead a web or a fireball just springs into existence without any previous indication that a spell was being cast, right? It's like having the subtle spell metamagic turned on for these spells all of the time for free, but even better because you also don't need material components. Like I said at the beginning, while the power of this feature may be difficult to quantify on a spreadsheet, it doesn't mean that it's not freaking awesome and powerful and really fun to use. The question is this, should you just at the beginning of the day like convert all of your spell slots into sorcery points and just use those for your spell casting? No, of course, because not all of your spells are psionic spells, right? So save a few spell slots for those important spells that don't qualify. At level nine, we would be a sorcerer seven and we get fourth level spells. As far as our psionic spells go, the first one that we get for free is Everd's Black Tentacles. And this is an amazing spell, and I'm going to use this spell for my concentration and control instead of Web or Hunger of Hadar, as long as I have the sorcery points or spell slots to cast it with, right? Everd's Black Tentacles. Never used it in a build, really. Like Web, it covers a 20-foot square. Unlike Web, it fills the area with, you guessed it, squirming ebony tentacles. The area is similarly difficult terrain, but now we get the fantastic fantastic when a creature enters the area for the first time on a turn or starts their turn there verbiage akin to moonbeam cloud of daggers spirit guardians all spells that we've built around in previous builds because this really enables us to do some great things both damage and control wise so yes upon entering or starting their turn in the area a creature has to succeed on a dexterity save or take 3d6 bludgeoning damage and be restrained by the tentacles until the spell ends if they start their turn there and are already restrained they take 3d6 damage again no save they can spend their action to make a dex or strength check their choice that's a little bit worse for us than web they make it against your spell save dc again to break that restraint so yes this spell is incredibly flavorful fantastic control and does some pretty decent damage to boot i love it madly for this build especially 
The other free spell that we get here as part of our psionic spells is Summon Aberration. It's really cool, but I think I would probably swap it out for Rolothim's Psychic Lance. Like Tasha's Mind Whip, this is a fantastic spell for both control and damage. Your target has to make, yes, an intelligence save, and if they fail, they take a hefty 76 damage and are incapacitated until the start of your next turn. Funny enough, while incapacitated means that they can't take actions and as a result bonus actions, or reactions, they can actually still move, which seems to belie the word incapacitated, but them's the rules. They're not like stunned or paralyzed or anything, though those conditions also inflict the incapacitated condition, among other things. Still, essentially keeping them from doing anything other than moving on their turn is an incredibly strong form of control. And this would also be a great one to consider twinning. It would be expensive, no doubt, for sorcery points, but incapacitating two targets for an entire round while doing some decent damage to them might be worth it once in a while. As for your non-psionic spells here, I think the two to give serious consideration to is Polymorph, of course, as it's both a powerful offensive and defensive spell, and maybe Wall of Fire, which is also potentially useful as like a soft control and damage option. But at level nine, it's time for our next damage report, and I think I'm gonna mix up our tactics just a smidge. Let's do this. Round one, we get black tentacles in place instead of web, either by quickening it so that we can Eldritch Blast afterwards, or by just using our action for it if we wanna conserve resources. On round two then, for our Nova round, let's Eldritch Blast with our action, pushing a couple of baddies into place of black tentacles, if and when we can, and then quicken a fourth level fireball. That sounds fun. Obviously, if you can get more than two enemies pushed into black tentacles, you should probably do that instead with the quicken spell, because it's not a ton of damage less. And here's the thing that I love about black tentacles and doing this area damage. There's a very good chance that especially if you're softening your enemies up with a fireball, if you just kind of focus on keeping a couple of bad guys pushed back into the tentacles every round, since they'll be taking some damage every turn from both your Eldritch Blasts and the tentacles themselves upon entering and when they start their turn there, by the time your party has dealt with the other enemies that you're not focusing on controlling, the ones that you have been keeping locked down just might be dead. I mean, with a lot of control spells like, say, Wall of Force, which is very potent, you shut some enemies down hard, but then when the other bad guys have been dealt with and you're ready to turn your attention to the ones that have been trapped behind Wall of Force, right, you drop that wall and now you've got two or three enemies that are still at full health and ready to rumble. Not so for our Mind Flayer. You might be keeping a couple of baddies locked down and just keep whittling away at their health over a few rounds so that like when the other half of the enemies are dealt with, the ones you've been controlling are dead too, or at the very most able to be pushed over with little more than a stiff breeze, right? And that's freaking awesome. So yes, in the pursuit of best case scenario numbers, we'll assume two targets getting hit by both a fireball, an Eldritch Blast apiece, and 4d6 damage from black tentacles every single round, right? Once upon entering the spell area, and again once on their turn. And under those assumptions, against enemies with a 10 AC and plus zero to their saving throws, we would do 104 damage during our burst round. And versus enemies with a 16 AC and a plus six to their saves, it's an 88. All right, now we're talking. That's more than double the damage since last we checked. And the good news is that most of this damage is coming from the fireball and the tentacles. And there's not a great chance that most of the enemies that you're gonna be going up against will have a plus to their deck save as high as a plus six. So you should expect some pretty healthy numbers there. Not only that, but again, I'm only assuming two targets for now. There's a really strong chance that you'll be able to get more than two targets with that fireball at least, but I was just too lazy to calculate one number for fireball and another for tentacles and Eldritch Blast. So I think we can feel fairly comfortable that these numbers are a little bit sandbagged. And that's a good thing too, since we are still near the bottom of tier four for total damage done compared to other multi-target Nova damage builds at this level. But yeah, to be fair, all the other builds are at the moment hitting three targets with their area of effect stuff. Again, regardless of the numbers, we're bringing a very healthy heaping of control, especially when you consider all the options available to us outside of our Nova round with telekinesis, mind whip, psychic lance now, etc., etc. And my favorite part is that so much of what we do can't be counterspelled, and we can do it a little more often 
thanks both to our ability to cast our best spells with sorcery points and our ability to recover at least some sorcery points on a short rest thanks to our Warlock spell slots. I am feeling like a pretty potent Tentacle Master at the moment, thank you very much. At level 10, we would be a Sorcerer 8 and we get another ability score increase or feat. I'm gonna recommend taking Meta Magic Adept. I've never recommended this feat in a build before and you're certainly free to go a different route, maybe something to shore up your defenses, for example, but I mean, no other sorcerer gets quite as much use out of their sorcery points as we do. So in my mind, taking this feat here makes a lot of sense. First off, the feat lets you choose two more meta magic options. That's fantastic. So now we can grab like heightened spell and careful spell, which is probably what I'd be doing, especially careful spell now that we're doing a lot more area of effect stuff and we'd love for our allies to automatically make their saving throws. But then best of all, with this feat, we get two more sorcery points. And while we're told that these two points can specifically only be used for meta magic, that's fine. We're casting Quicken Spell at least once per day, so there shouldn't be any conflict here. It just frees us up to be casting a little bit more with our sorcery points, and that feels, again, especially important for this build. At level 11, we'd be a Sorcerer 9, and we get 5th level spells. As for the free ones that we get from Psionic Spells, Telepathic Bond is a fantastic utility spell. It basically lets you speak telepathically with your whole party. Telekinesis is also really great in that it lets you move both enemies and allies and even objects all around the battlefield. You can even restrain enemies, though it does require both your action and your concentration, so I probably wouldn't be using that unless someone else had a nice area of effect control spell that you were trying to place enemies into. Of the two, I think I'd probably swap out Telepathic Bond at this level since we already have some decent ways to communicate telepathically, even if they're not quite as powerful. The real question is, what spell should we swap it for? There are a lot of great options, actually. Hold Monster is an incredibly powerful spell that would let you paralyze just about any enemy, and that's probably the most powerfully debilitating status you can inflict on an enemy next to the unconscious status or the dead status. Dominate Person would let you actually take control of a humanoid anyway, and that's amazing. But I think for me, the spell I'd probably most want as a psionic spell here for this build is Synaptic Static. I am just in love with this spell. It does fireball-like damage, 8d6, which, you know, fireball as a fifth level spell would do 10d6, so a little bit more, but it's in the same area, 20 foot radius, but then it has two amazing additional things going for it compared to fireball. First off, avoiding all of the damage requires an intelligence save which is just, again, a lot lower for most enemies in D&D than dexterity. Second off, if they fail their save, they have muddled thoughts for one minute, and this means that they have to subtract a D6 from all of their ability checks and attack rolls and their concentration checks. Now, they do get to make an intelligence save at the end of their turn to try and end that effect, but I mean, man, sure you're doing 2d6 less damage than Fireball, but who cares? Forcing an intelligence save and giving that really powerful debuff is just so worth it. Not to mention that it does psychic damage, which is less often resisted than fire and is way more on point for this character thematically anyway. Don't forget, at 11th level now, Eldritch Blast does three beams, a 50% damage increase, and potentially the ability to push yet another target into the loving arms of our tentacles is, of course, very welcome. At level 12, now that we've gotten Synaptic Static, we've reached the peak of our psionic spells. You don't get any psionic spells past 5th level spells. And also a healthy heaping of sorcery points. I think it might be time to grab the inevitable fighter levels that most burst or nova damage builds really benefit from. Of course, you don't have to, but I think now is the time to do so if we haven't done so already. So, yeah, I'm going fighter one here. That means medium armor proficiency and shield proficiency. And yeah, I think for that reason alone, maybe it might be worth considering starting level one in fighter. I mean, the difference between medium armor and a shield compared to just mage armor is an extra four AC if we can get half plate anyway. And that's not nothing to sneeze at. And I mean, that's not even assuming magic armor or magic shield, right? But anyway, 
we have it now, we're happy. We also, as a fighter one, get second wind, which lets us heal ourselves for 1d10 plus our fighter levels as a bonus action once per short rest. And then we get a fighting style. I'm probably going with a defense fighting style. It's a little boring. It just lets us add a plus one to our AC if we're wearing armor. But that means, you know, having a fighter level here is a difference of plus five minimum to our armor class compared to where we were before. And that's just really, really nice. At level 13, we would be a fighter two, and of course we get action surge, and of course it's the main reason we came fighter in the first place, though the defensive benefits were also fantastic. But yes, now, once per short rest, we can get two actions on our turn instead of one. And for us, that's basically going to mean a second barrage of Eldritch Blast during our Nova round, as we'll be quickening Synaptic Static, and then Eldritch Blast, Action Surge, Eldritch Blast, right? And yes, just in time for our damage report, that's that's what we're doing tactically now. You know, I'm just assuming, again, round one, setting up black tentacles, then round two on our Nova round, push a bunch of enemies with Eldritch Blast, Action Surge, push a bunch more, right? And maybe that might mean rounding them up to get them within the area of effect of black tentacles if possible, synaptic static at a minimum, because then yes, quicken spell, bonus action, synaptic static, doing some nice area damage, and muddling a bunch of enemies' thoughts lowering their attacks and their ability checks by d6. I mean, let's just talk for a minute here about what these poor souls are going to be enduring at the hands of our Mind Flayer selves. Or maybe not hands, mind. At the mind of our Mind Flayer selves. First off, out of nowhere, a mass of writhing tentacles appear, restraining and smacking them around. On their turn, they might manage to free themselves and move out of the tentacles, just to find you staring at them sinisterly, where again, without warning, an explosion of psychic energy radiates all around you, muddling your thoughts, searing your brain. You shake your head to clear it and find yourself blasted by a beam of pure energy that pushes you back into the waiting arms of the tentacles you've just escaped from. Now you have a choice. Do you waste your time trying to extract yourself again? Or do you try to make a futile attack against this Mind Flayer or one of their companions, which would be made both with disadvantage thanks to the restraint and a minus D6 to hit thanks to Synaptic Static? <sighs> Might as well waste another turn trying to escape the tentacles again. Although that minus D6 is going to apply to the ability check that you're making, strength or dexterity based, to get out of the tentacles. I mean, what's the point? We might as well just stay here and die. <laughs> that squid face is just going to push us right back in again anyway, even if we manage to get out, right? I love this combo. It's so potent and fun and powerful. But yes, as far as the damage goes, against enemies with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their saving throws, we would on average do 182 damage total. And I am counting this against three targets now that we have three Eldritch Beams going. And against an enemy with a 17 armor class and a plus seven to their saves, it would be 155 damage on average. And this to me just feels like the pinnacle of this character's career. We have all of our tools and we are just unleashing psychic horror upon our bedraggled foes. Compared to other area of effect burst damage builds, we're still near the bottom of tier four at this level, but I honestly don't even care that much. I'm doing a ton of damage, putting out heaps of control and debuffing, and I'm just disgusting in the best way possible. I love it. At level 14, you know, we really want more sorcery points, right? Arguably, the best way to get more sorcery points is by taking more warlock levels. Since, as we've discussed, we can convert even those warlock spell slots at the rate of 1 to 1, and since we get those warlock spell slots back on a short rest, taking another warlock level here, which is what I'm going to do, would mean we have second level spell slots, among other things, meaning we have two more sorcery points per short rest. And that might be more than one for another sorcery level plus five for another fifth level spell slot that we would get had we gone sorcerer, right? Depending on how many short rests your party gets per day. Now granted, with two more sorcerer levels, we'd get six level spells, and that's kind of a big deal. Among other things, it would mean Mass Suggestion, one of the best control spells in game, and for a character who's concerned with control above all, as we are, seems a little crazy not to go for it, right? If you want to, go ahead and go for it. For me, more sorcery points back on a short rest, plus the other goodies we get from more warlock levels are a little more appealing, personally. If for no other reason than because neither Synaptic Static nor Everett's Black Tentacles actually benefit from upcasting, so I don't feel the same level of pressure to keep getting higher level spell slots, right? But anyway, 
I'm going Warlock 3 here. That means we get second level spells, and I'm just gonna say pick your favorites. There's lots of good ones to choose from. None that I feel we absolutely have to have for this build, so knock yourself out. And then we get our Pact Boon. I kinda wanna say pick your favorite here too. I think I probably go Pact of the Chain. I feel like I'm using that a lot, but honestly, unless you're really going to invest in them, the other Pacts in my mind just don't do quite as much for us as having a free invisible familiar would, and that's what we get from Pact of the Chain essentially, right? Meaning you can get some great scouting out of them and even, of course, advantage on one of your Eldritch Blasts if you have them take the help action, right? Feel free to go with another Pact if you really want to. At level 15, we would be a Warlock 4 and we get another ability score increase or feat. Sticking with the recent theme, I'm going to say pick your favorite. I would be looking to shore up my defenses here, I think, probably via like Warcaster, which would give us advantage on our concentration checks, among other things, or just bumping our constitution for more hit points, better concentration check, better constitution save, or maybe Resilient Wisdom, as that's a very important saving throw and we don't have a great Wisdom score right now, so anyway probably one of those three. At level 16, we would be a Warlock 5, and we get third level spells. Again, pick your favorite. Lots of great options here, but none that we haven't mentioned already, I don't think. And yeah, to be honest, again, I'm probably converting these third level spell slots into six juicy sorcery points every single short rest. That is really juicy. We do also at this level get a third Eldritch Invocation, and I think think we gotta go Grasp of Hadar. The truth is, there will often be enemies that will be somewhat close to your black tentacles, but on the wrong side of them from where you are. And you're just not gonna have the move speed to get all the way around to try and push them in, right? But with Grasp of Hadar, we can now pull an enemy into the tentacles as well when we hit them with an Eldritch Blast. And that's very often gonna mean one more enemy into our control that we weren't able to get before. Unfortunately, with Grasp of Hadar, you can only pull once per turn, as opposed to Repelling Blast, which is usable on any casting of Eldritch Blast. But again, it should be enough to get at least one more enemy into the area of your Synaptic Static, if not your Black Tentacles every turn, and that's just lovely. And finally, for us, at level 17, I'm just gonna go Warlock 6 here. I don't have super strong feelings about level 6 in Warlock, but assuming we'd continue this character past level 17, I do love the idea of getting 4th and eventually even 5th level Warlock spell slots here to just convert into gobs of sorcery points, among other goodies we can potentially get, so yeah, probably sticking with Warlock here. And we do get some nice little utility and defensive perks from being a Fathomless Warlock at level 6. Oceanic Soul, first off, gives us resistance to cold damage, nice and lets us communicate with other creatures who share a language with us when both of us are submerged. Cool. We also get Guardian Coil, which lets us use our reaction to reduce damage to any of our party members, including ourselves, if one of us gets hit by an attack while within 10 feet of our Tentacle of the Deeps. Blocked by a tentacle, sucker! Well, partially blocked, anyway. It only reduces the damage by 1d8, so it's nothing to write home about, especially at this level, but hey, it just might be the difference between life and death, you never know. Most importantly for us, at level 17, our Eldritch Blast now goes to 4 beams. And for our final damage report, then at 17, not much has changed for us tactically, and even numerically during our Nova round, other than that extra beam we get to fire when we use Eldritch Blast, and of course, since we're action surging and doing it twice, that means two more Eldritch Beams during our Nova round. Our go-to spells don't upcast at all, like I've mentioned, but you know what? We're gonna have a boatload of sorcery points to cast them with. So this means that we're gonna be able to Nova a lot more frequently than most of the other Nova builds that I've ever built. Not to mention, exercise a lot of control on the battlefield too, more often. So, chin up. And yeah, against enemies with a 10 armor class and a plus zero to their saving throws, we would now, on average, during our Nova round, do 208 damage, and against enemies with an 18 AC and a plus 8 to their saves, it would be 175 damage. We broke the Bicentennial Barrier. Woohoo. Alas, we've also dropped to dead last in tier 4 compared to other multi-target Nova builds at this level, but I still don't care. We are a freaky, controlling nightmare of psychic terror. So, 
Let's get into final thoughts. The tier score for this character, if you take the damage that they do against all of the ACs that we calculate for at each of the damage reports and just average them all together, is 110. And while that would put us near the top of tier three if we were comparing ourselves to single target burst damage builds, it puts us near the bottom of tier four since we're comparing ourselves to other multi-target damage builds. And I'm 100% not bothered by that in the slightest because we are bringing things that those other builds do not. Really solid, fantastic control and debuffing, both during our Nova round and otherwise. I mean, twinning Rolothim Psychic Lance on enemies? Or upcasting Tasha's Mind Whip? Slowing enemies, telekinetically pulling them back into our tentacles, continuing to push them with Eldritch Blast? We are going to be a terror on the battlefield for our enemies and our DM. And not to mention, best of all, the ability to be an aberrant horror. Especially if you're into tentacles, I really hope you get to play this build one day. And you know what? After having built the character, I think maybe I have developed something of a tentacle fetish myself. <laughs> because I would absolutely love to play this character in the game. I have a bad feeling that several of the DMs who are watching this are going to end up using this character as like a boss or a mini boss NPC in their campaign. And if so, please apologize to your future players on my behalf. Sorry, everyone. But that's the build for the week. We better wrap up because I fear we may have gone a bit long. I hope you guys know that I love you. I do. You're awesome. Thank you so much for all of the support that you give me by commenting, liking, subscribing, and even joining the channel as a member. I hope you'll check out the other content in the channel if you're not in the habit of doing so. But more importantly, I hope you have a really great day and a fantastic week. And I hope that you're kind and good and happy and that I see you again really soon. But until then, take care. And there's this burning Like there's always been I've never been so alone And I've never been so alive Hmm I'm good And I can't get the microphone to just do what I want to do today Alright How's that? There's so that I wanna know New York City's evil The surface is everything But I could never do that Someone would see through that And this is the last time We'll be friends again and I'll get over you You'll wonder who I am and there's this burning Just like there's always been I've never been so alone, alone And I've, and I've, I've never been so alive Whew. That gives me chills just thinking about it Third Eye Blind, first album, 1997 It's just one of those albums Like every single song on it this is so good. Is it telekinesis or telekinetic? Oh, I can't remember. I think it's telekinetic. Blah, 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 blah. It's telekinetic, right? It's telekinetic. I know it's telekinetic. It's telekinetic. Okay. I hope not, because I got really tired of constantly being attacked by the Silvery Bob's Marb. <laughs> Marb? N maybe this might be the time. Well, no, never mind. If you haven't done... No, I can't because it has to be a spell of the same level. I'm going to confirm that too. I hope I'm not wrong. Okay. Ugh. Neither synaptic snat... <laughs> synaptic static... Ugh. Synaptic static. Say that five times fast. And that... <clears throat> hmm. There's some construction going on outside. That's kind of noisy. Snake eyes. Is ready to go. You know, somebody made a comment on on the gunk that like I should have been wearing the snake eyes video for that or the snake eyes 
shirt for that, right? Because he's totally like a ninja that uses a gun. Although I never really liked Snake Eyes using an Uzi. It just felt, it's like, nah, man, you don't need that. You got your katana, you got your martial arts. Like, Storm Shadow didn't use a gun. Don't, 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 don't use that crutch. Come on, man.